Good morning. My name is Sheena Weir, and it's my pleasure as Executive Director of the Law Society's External Relations and Communications Division to welcome you to this Access to Justice Week session. Au nom de notre trésorière, j'ai le plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue ici aujourd'hui. I wish to start by recognizing that we are here together in Toronto, which is a Mohawk word that means where there are trees standing in the water. I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit First Nation and acknowledge the Haudenosaunee and the long history of all the First Nations in Ontario and the Métis and Inuit peoples. It is wonderful to have so many people joining us today, some here in the room, in person, and many over our webcast for such an important discussion. Thank you. This morning's panel discussion aims to equip licensees, frontline officers, and service providers with an understanding and the tools to assist them when interacting with self-represented litigants and unrepresented litigants. The Law Society recognizes the challenges of self-represented litigants in navigating this justice system. I was fortunate to have had the opportunity recently to participate in a roundtable uh, hosted by the Treasurer, which included self-reps. This program today is a direct result of that meeting. Today, we aim to enhance the knowledge of lawyers and paralegals to better accommodate self-reps in navigating the justice system. Nous voulons continuer la dialogue pour répondre aux besoins croissants de la communauté. To that end, the Law Society is undertaking a number of activities, including reviewing and revising our public communications, taking into account feedback that we've received from self-reps in that meeting with the Treasurer, providing continuing professional development programming and practice management resources to assist lawyers and paralegals when interacting with self-reps. Considering the conduct rules as they pertain to interactions with self-reps as part of the ongoing rule review process, and supporting and promoting the use of unbundled legal services and legal coaching. Additionally, the Action Group continues to facilitate discussions with various stakeholders through initiatives like Access to Justice Week. I look forward to hearing the perspectives of today's esteemed panelists. Before hearing from them, though, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, Janice Krieger. Ms. Krieger was called to the bar in 1985. She practiced personal injury and insurance law until 2015, working both for the plaintiff and defense clients. In 1996, Ms. Krieger was appointed as a deputy judge of the Small Claims Court in Hamilton. She is currently serving her eighth consecutive three-year appointment as a deputy judge. As a deputy judge, Ms. Krieger deals solely with civil cases, many of them either brought by or defended by self-represented litigants. From 2015 to 2019, Ms. Krieger was elected as a bencher of the Law Society of Ontario. She served as vice chair of the Paralegal Standing Committee and as a member of the Audit and Finance and Tribunal Committees. She also served as a bencher adjudicator for the Law Society Tribunal. Ms. Krieger is currently serving as a mentor of the Law Practice Program, and we were just talking about that. She's enjoying it very much. That's where she's mentoring young law school graduates who are seeking to be licensed as lawyers in Ontario. And she did note with me that they're not all young, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an array of people. Je veux remercier de votre présence à ce programme important maintenant and now. Please join me in welcoming Janice. Thank you, and thank you, Sheena. It's certainly good to be back at the Law Society, and I'm very pleased to have been asked to moderate this morning's panel discussion. As Sheena said, we would like to equip licensees, frontline officers, and service providers with a better understanding and some tools to assist them when they interact with self-represented litigants, whether in court or not in court. I need to begin with a bit of a disclaimer the panel aims to offer a constructive dialogue with a practical focus on the tools and resources available to assist practitioners and support staff and the public. Please note the panelists are providing general information and not legal advice. We ask viewers to refer to the information sheet to learn more about the resources and information available to fulfill their legal needs within their means. Let me now introduce our esteemed panelists. I will start from my far right. 
with Ms. Tammy Mosco, who is the Senior Family Counsel at the Office of the Chief Justice Superior Court of Justice. Ms. Mosco provides advice to Chief Justice Jeffrey Morowitz and Senior Family Justice Sutrin on any and all issues relating to family law, family court processes, and the Unified Family Court. This includes developing internal and external resources for the Superior Court of Justice to assist with the resolution of family cases, including a new guide to process for family law litigants. It also includes assisting with the development and implementation of best practices for family law and child protection proceedings. Ms. Mosco also advises on improvements to the family law rules and family justice innovations. Working closely with members of the ministry, the Family Law Bar, and other stakeholders. Over the past three years, Ms. Mosco has contributed to several successful family law initiatives, including co-chairing the Walsh Family Law Negotiation Competition and contributing to the development of Clio's new Steps to Justice website. She was also instrumental in the recent Unified Family Court expansion in Ontario, as well as the recent launch of Ontario's Family Law Limited Scope Services Project. Next to Ms. Mosco, and immediately to her left, is Joel Miller, founder of The Family Law Coach. After 50 years of private practice, Joel has shifted his attention and practice to exclusively serving family law self-represented litigants. He operates a virtual law office through The Family Law Coach, providing affordable, unbundled services, and coaching remotely by phone and email. His effort is directed to helping those caught in a system not designed for them, providing an understanding of how to navigate the courts, legal assistance and advice as needed, and coaching to present their case with maximum effectiveness. Finding ways to provide and price services of value to those who can't afford traditional full-service lawyers helps both the individual self-rep and everyone else in the family court system. Before founding the Family Law Coach in 2015, Joel practiced as a traditional, full-service family law lawyer in Toronto since graduating from the University of Toronto Law School in 1968. He was a partner at Ricketts Harris, a mid-sized Toronto law firm, and chair of their family law group for 14 years. He taught at the Bar Admissions course and has been a dispute resolution officer for the Superior Court for over a dozen years. To Joel's left is Heather Wee Litwin, who is co-founder of the Self-Rep Navigators Association. Ms. Litwin, Ms. Wee Litwin is a non-practicing lawyer whose work is focused on public legal education. She graduated from Osgoode Hall and was called to the bar in 2012. Before becoming a lawyer, she was involved in a personal civil lawsuit which sparked her interest in the law. During her litigation, she has been both a self-represented litigant as well as a client under, tradi under traditional full retainers. She's now founder of a public legal education project called Litigation Help, where lawyers and mediators give talks on legal topics at the Toronto Public Library and on the project's own YouTube channel. She is also the co-founder of the Self-Rep Navigators Association, a group of lawyers who support one another while practicing unbundled services. And immediately to my right, we have Noel Semple, who is Associate Professor at the University of Windsor. Noel is a professor at the University of Windsor Faculty of Law and the author of Accessibility, Quality, and Profitability for Personal Plight Law Firms, Hitting the Sweet Spot, published by the Canadian Bar Association. Noel studies access to justice. His work asks how the law and legal institutions work in real life. It also aspires to improve the ability of law and legal institutions actually to create justice. Empirical research, both quantitative and qualitative, and policy analysis are key tools in his scholarship. Noel draws upon and seeks to contribute to the law and society and empirical legal studies traditions. Noel's work has appeared in the Family Court Review, the Osgood Hall Law Journal, and the International Journal of the Legal Profession, among others. Between 2017 and 2019, he was editor-in-chief of the Windsor Yearbook of Access to Justice. In March 2017, he received the Windsor Student Law Society Faculty Award for teaching. 
Thank you to all of you for making yourselves available this morning. Please welcome our panelists. We thought what we would do today, can everybody hear me? Good. Um, we thought what we would do today is run this more or less as a discussion format. Um, so I will be posing some questions that we have uh, put together in advance and uh, we'll have one or two or perhaps all of the panelists state their views on the particular question um, so that you can hear uh, everybody's views on particular items. So we're going to start off with a very general question. What resources are available to licensees, frontline officers and service providers to assist them when interacting with self-represented litigants? And perhaps I'll start with Tammy, since you're furthest away. There we go. <laughs> sure. Um, well, uh, there is a handout that was prepared that um, gives you a really high level um, list of some of the information, tools, services, and resources. Um, it's focused on family law, but not exclusive to family law. I only know family law, so that's, that's probably why. Um, what I want to say is that the landscape has really changed and if you're working in any way in this area um, you should do use the resources um, that we've provided and and do a little bit more updated research like I, I, when we started working in this area um, the Law Commission did a report called the Entry Reports into Family Justice. And it basically said that th th there's too much, you can't tell the quality, people don't know where to go. And the system, at least the family justice system, participants have worked really hard to um, make clear entry points into high quality resources. So um, through Clio's Steps to Justice website that was uh, mentioned earlier, that's not just family law. Family law is the area that I was involved in. Um, that is a really great place to start. The court websites and, and things like the resource list that we gave, there's a, a, a version on the Family Law Limited Scope Services Project. But we're trying to help do the work for um, the service providers and the litigants to get them to the specific help that they need easier. Uh, the Family Law Information Centers is a great place to go. You still have to go in person. Very few of them offer um, remote or, vir or virtual services. But I think it's, um, there, there's more that is high quality collaborative information um, and services and I think it's, I hope it's easier to get to. Um, you know, there's from websites to actual services to tools, the landscape is changing fairly rapidly. Um, and I think that that's good, but it, it requires all of us uh, to do a little more work to kind of stay on top of it so that we can give good advice to our clients. Um, I think the landscape is changing. We're going to see more change and more stuff developed in the near future. So um, one piece, uh, for instance, so the Family Law Limited Scope Services Project, because nothing can have a short name, um, was launched within over the past year with support from the Law Foundation. And um, it um, makes it much more transparent how litigants can access unbundled legal services for family law in Ontario. You don't have to be in court. It can be connected to a mediation, a negotiation, just for some advice. Um, but there's a resource page there that has some of these resources. Um, and we're working continuously. So one thing that we're borrowing from one of the states, and I'm going to forget which one it's uh, from, um, but they have a client notebook. And it's this amazing concept of helping clients to identify the issues and then get the help and organize themselves so that when they want to use unbundled services, they're not starting from scratch anytime they go to see a lawyer or other service provider. So um, we will soon add the, their issues, or an Ontario version of their issues checklist to the Family Law Services, Family, FLIS, Family Law Limited Scope Services Project website. Um, and we're working on doing more of that. So the goal is to make it easier for the litigant to, to um, get the help that they want when they want it. So that they maintain responsibility for carriage of their matter, but they can walk in to see a duty counsel if those services are still available to them, um, or Joel, or, or um, even the IRC, the Information and Referral Coordinator, and that person can right away see what's happened so far, where they're at, 
Is there disclosure that's necessary? Have the issues been identified? Have they attempted mediation? And so it's intended to be easier for the client to get cost-efficient professional help when they want to and to make that more value added for them. So you said a couple of interesting things and then you mentioned Joel and I wanted to move on to Joel because your, uh, your uh, focus is on the court side, Tammy. Um, Joel, take about three minutes maybe and just tell us a little bit about the Family Law Coach that you've started. Well, the Family Law Coach came about uh, because as I, uh, you can tell I've been a lawyer for a long, long time. I've been dyeing my hair since I was 35 to try to look wise, but uh, at this stage of the game, I don't have to dye it anymore. Uh, and I was beginning to think of retiring, and I noticed one day, uh, to my shock and chagrin, when I was in family court, that there were twice as many people there without lawyers than there were there with lawyers. And frankly, I had simply never seen these people before. I'd never noticed them and didn't realize that we had a system that uh, catered to lawyers with rules and forms and procedures that uh, I had gone to school about but that two-thirds of the people there were unfamiliar with it. Uh, I was approaching retirement, uh, trying to think of something to do, uh, and I came across the National um, Self-Represented Litigants Project Report, which talked about self-reps. It was really uh, Ontario and Alberta, I think, but it's uh, groundbreaking throughout North America. And it described who self-reps were. It described uh, how old they were, their ages, their incomes, their education, the problems they had, the difficulties uh, that they faced, but frankly, it didn't reach the point of suggesting what we as lawyers could uh, do. And I don't know how many family law lawyers there are uh, paying attention uh, to this particular issue. I know I hadn't. When I began to think about it, uh, it struck me that uh, we could uh, uh, find ways of creating, pricing, and delivering family law assistance outside of the normal way of doing it. And that was the genesis of the family law coach in which uh, people buy time by the hour. I don't sell services, I don't sell uh, tasks as much as I sell uh, time. They fill the time, they decide how much they want. The service is entirely online so that whether you're in North York or North Bay, it's equally accessible. Whether you're at a coffee break uh, or at a hockey arena, you're, you can access your lawyer. Uh, it's a way of trying to get uh, the legal assistance that the individuals who cannot afford a full service lawyer, uh, to get them the assistance that they need. It's not to replace a full service lawyer. Full service lawyers will do better than someone who has no experience in court, but uh, it seems to me that this is one of the ways that we can help uh, litigants. This is not a concept that I think is limited to family law, but I wanted to say, forgive me for just going on for just a moment, uh, we, we are both blessed and cursed in Ontario. We're blessed in that, uh, as near as I can tell, we have more services for people who are acting for themselves, more information than most jurisdictions throughout North America. Uh, Clio has been around for uh, years with their Steps to Justice, which is outstanding. Very few other jurisdictions uh, have that. Uh, Tammy just uh, referred to and has been instrumental in developing the limited, uh, the family law limited uh, services, limited scope oh. services, uh, FLIS is the easiest way of saying it, um, project which is, uh, we were talking about this, and we're just not certain if there's anybody else in North America who's doing uh, this particular project, which is combining a list of people who have been providing uh, unbundled services for uh, a minimum of two years, so that it's not as if they're just playing around with this, uh, and that service also provides coaching. So that, uh, and Ryerson, the Legal Innovation Zone, has just come up with an interactive uh, process as well. Uh, for family law. So there are services that are available. We're blessed for that. Where we're not blessed is that for reasons that are mystifying, we have the Flick offices in every courthouse, where we're not blessed is that for reasons that are mystifying, the overwhelming majority of people who are in family court don't fully realize and appreciate the extent of the services that there are available uh, for them. And somehow or other, if we could get that message out more, we actually have uh, resources. That's not to say that we should stop. I don't mean that in any way, shape, or form. The whole concept of coaching 
which um, uh, uh, Madam Justice Boncalo spoke about in, in her uh, family law review as something new. Uh, I find that occupies probably 80% of my practice. Um, that as a concept is going to be very helpful as more and more lawyers begin doing it. So that there are resources available. We need to encourage more and more people to ask for the resources and we need, frankly, amongst the profession to encourage more and more of ourselves to be attentive to the fact that there are, as I say, twice as many people in family court looking for services as there are hiring lawyers. There's a terrific uh, market, if I could put it that way, if lawyers would say, I don't need to restrict, I don't need to be a full service lawyer, I can be an unbundled service lawyer, and uh, that, I think, is of great help to people. If I well, could just clarify, um, both BC and Alberta do have unbundled rosters. Yes. Um, I haven't seen any in the States, but Canada's been, there are a few jurisdictions in Canada that have been quite progressive. Um, it's interesting, since launching the project, we've trained over 300 family lawyers in providing unbundled services, and over half of them have joined the roster, representing over 30 communities. So, Joel, I think you're right. I think we need to we need to get we need to do more in terms of public awareness and in terms of um, uh, scope of the project. But I think we have come a far way in a short period of time. And I say that because when I started really focusing on this area only four years ago, no offense to my friend and colleague Judah who might be hiding somewhere, but LawPro had caution tape on its website on unbundling. And, and lawyers, it might not surprise those of you in the room, we, we tend to be a bit risk averse because this is our business and we don't like to be sued. So I, I, I don't think we're where, anywhere near where we want to be, but I think we have made very concrete progress in the last couple of years and I think we've laid the groundwork to continue. Um, and I'll just make a plug. If anyone is a family lawyer who's interested in legal coaching training, we will be offering one soon at a highly reduced rate in Toronto. Um, and um, we are looking, coaching is the one piece that is, I think, very um, underutilized and, and very new. Family lawyers have actually been doing unbundled service on an ad hoc or informal basis for certainly since I was called in the late 90s. The coaching piece and model is quite innovative and quite different, and so we're really anxious or really excited about getting out and doing some training so that that is more readily available. The, uh, well, and the interesting part about what Joel is talking about, and I'm gonna ask Heather about this as well, is that these are innovations in service delivery and innovations in service model, rather than some kind of um, pricing innovation or some technological innovation. It's still a person-to-person -person thing. And Heather, um, we've talked about family, obviously, because that, that seems to be the family end of the panel. Um, but Heather, you're working in the straight civil litigation area. Tell us a little bit about your project, Navigating Self-Rep, is it Self-Rep Navigators? Um, yes, so it's uh, called, sorry. Is this okay? <clears throat> so it's called Self Rep Navigators, and actually Joel is on it as well. Joel has been with us ever since the beginning. Um, I was actually, um, so this is back in 2015, around there, and I was searching around. I still remember our first phone call, and Joel said, how did you find me? <laughs> he said that. Um, so it was really wonderful. So back then, a few of us got together, uh, a few of us lawyers, and we all um, are, have our passion in access to justice, and we, we want to do something about it. So we got together and we formed this group and basically um, it's just a, a, a group of lawyers who are getting together well we were in person back then um, and we actually got to know one another and we would uh, support each other that discussing um, practice issues uh, especially I think our favorite was probably risk <laughs> um, so um, so that started in 2015 um, and uh, I've kind of um, expanded my work. Um, so as Janice said, um, I'm coming from the civil litigation side, my big gigantic lawsuit, which lasted 10 years. Um, and uh, it ended up in a, in a 12 day trial. Um, that actually taught a lot to me, for me, uh, about the civil litigation. And, and so sort of armed with that knowledge, which is um, coming from a, a lay person's perspective, um, I, I feel like I definitely 
um, can see what a, a lay person, what a lay client sees, um, which would be different from, say, my colleagues who um, start in law school in, at the age of 25 and, and you know, they become litigators. So anyway, um, I, I'm just, uh, just a few words about civil litigation. I don't know if I can, uh, just very briefly, <laughs> yeah. very briefly. Explain um, civil litigation. In less uh, civil litig <laughs> um, so uh, in the world of civil, lit civil litigation, um, the, the, uh, so one of the things that I, I remember, we were, we were full clients, like we were regular clients, we were clients under a traditional retainer, and then um, the, uh, the legal fees kind of spiral out of control, I think that happens a lot, um, and then we decided to be self-reps, and I remember um, going onto the Ontario Court Forms website, and you, you know, I think as, as lawyers we, we, we know that when we do that, it, we're going to get ourselves in trouble because the templates on the ministry's website, when you download it, you don't know what to do with it. It's very cryptic. There's only a few lines and you don't know what anything means. So you fill it out completely wrong and then you, you go to the courthouse and the clerk will reject your documents because it's completely wrong. And then they will say this famous line, go get a lawyer. So, um, so definitely, uh, I remember the challenge um, back then. Um, I was just a first-year law student when I was self-representing, and I didn't know what was, didn't know what to do. Um, and ever since then, I've sort of um, developed uh, my my work now to fill the gap, so to speak. So what I do now is um, I speak at uh, libraries uh, to try to educate the public uh, about uh, what the resources. Um, I think that Tammy and, and Joel, you're saying that we need to get out there and just tell people about the resources. We have these great resources, Steps to Justice, FLIS, um, and you know, I go out, you know, when I talk to people, uh, just in, in general, they go, what? Um, they, they, they'd never heard of FLIS or, or Step to Justice or CLIO, what's CLIO? Um, even the uh, National self represented Litigation Project, um, I mean, Ju Professor Julie McFarland has been on CBC several times, but I still come across many, many clients who say, who, Julie, who? Like, I mean, so it's just really difficult, but we want to get out there, we want uh, to educate the public, and I'm, I'm just doing my, my part, uh, my little part, right, at these days, so I speak at the Toronto Reference Library, uh, I'm going to be teaching uh, how to use Candly uh, starting January 2020, so I'm really lucky about that. Um, and I'm also going to be um, using uh, Professor McFarland's uh, excellent primers uh, that she has. So um, I think that the uh, Clio uh, Steps to Justice, uh, for, I, I think, is it more family? Family side? No, well, no, steps no, justice, I think there are 10 areas of law covered. Ten? Oh, okay, Family's right. just one of them. Just one of them, right. But um, the, <coughs> just to clarify for people, um, Steps to Justice was total, a total revamp of Clio's web um, content. They, they've had um, all sorts of public legal information for years. But what they did, started, starting with family three or four years ago, is it's all question and answer driven so that when people Google, when does my child support end, they can get to the actual answer right away without being directed mm. to seven different resources. And it's even better because not only does it answer the question, it then says next steps and related resources. So what they're trying to do again is that kind of get to the, the end point earlier, but I don't, I think there's maybe employment and housing. You can oh, look, okay. it's, it's many areas, it's not everything. Right. But there are also, I mean, there's the pro bono Ontario telephone services. Um, there, right. there are a number of different ways where people can get to that more kind of targeted legal information and advice. Some of them are income tested. So um, some is not available to a family, some are not available to a family if you earn over X dollars. But right. um, there, there are a few different services there that aren't specific to family. In fact, pro bono doesn't do any family law. Right. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to do is I would go to the library and I'd be giving several talks, uh, even this year, um, sort of like, it's like a list of just kind of introducing all these different wonderful organizations, which otherwise they wouldn't know. Um, and uh, I, I, I think, um, sorry. So, uh, yeah, all I right. think that's about well, thank you. Now, I heard you mention the National Self-Represented Litigants Project, and I'm going to ask Noel about that because Noel's from the university, well, he's not from Windsor, he, he's at the University of Windsor, and that's something that Windsor's been very proud of. Tell us a little bit about that, Noel. Janice, it sounds like being from Windsor is an insult the way no, you were talking No, I love Windsor. I went to law school in Windsor. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so yeah, just picking up on what Heather said uh, about the self represented Litigant Project, which is led by my colleague, uh, Professor Julie McFarlane at the University of Windsor Faculty of Law. 
Uh, so uh, I expect it's on the list on the handout. I'm sure the website is there, representingyourselfcanada.com. Uh, so that has uh, wonderful practical resources, right? So there's a directory of professionals assisting self-reps. There's very uh, concrete court-based guides. But the other thing you need to know about uh, the NSRLP and about Julie's work is that there's an edge to it, right? It's not just practical, sort of officially sanctioned help materials. There is a, an advocacy piece uh, that, that she develops, which is about whether uh, the system is perhaps rigged against self-reps and whether people within the system and in positions of power in the system are perhaps using that power in illegitimate ways that makes life tougher for self-reps. Uh, so it's, uh, it's definitely a refreshing perspective to take a look at, so I'd uh, encourage you to have a look. Some, some might question that word refreshing, but I'm not doubting that there are some very <laughs> valuable tools that are available. Mm -hmm. um, I'll leave it at that. Well, yet there's always going to be tension. The, uh, we have some interesting questions from um, uh, our web audience. Uh, just a quick one for, Tam, uh, for Tammy. When is the family law coaching training taking place? Where to get? Where do, the, where do people get information on that? I, we will post it on the fam, so um, it's in the materials. The family law. It's um, www.familylawlss.ca. Um, we'll post it there, but also there's a contact us. So if you send an email, we're looking at um, January dates, but we haven't nailed them down. It will be the first one will be a January, a, a Saturday in January. Um, but just let me know if you're interested, and I will share information. All right. The um, uh, there was a question uh, which was said to be basic. Well, I'm not so sure it is basic. Uh, it says a very be basic question. What is meant by unbundled services? Um, I think it's fair to say that unbundled services involve having a lawyer do a particular task for you, rather than having the lawyer do the whole lawsuit or the whole dispute. So, for example. You might, um, and I know this happens a lot at small claims court where I sit, um, uh, self-represented litigants might attend on a lawyer to have the lawyer draft the claim. And the lawyer would be paid for drafting the claim, but the client would then, or the self-represented litigant, would then pursue the rest of the lawsuit themselves. Um, likewise with, say, a statement of defense, or in family law, perhaps an application, and the sworn statements that need to go with that that sort of thing, and then pursue the rest of it themselves. So unbundling involves sort of breaking down the tasks and having a lawyer do one or more of those. Um, I think what's important about it is something that Joel and I were talking about before the panel started, that it leaves the control in the hands of the litigant, right? Both as to price and as to availability and the use of it. So those unbundled services are very important. And as Heather and I were also discussing before the panel started, They've been very underutilized. But lawyers are sort of slow to um, pick up the idea that they can do these things, um, and it's uh, a true innovation in service delivery. Dennis, might I, yeah. might I comment on that? I don't know how many people uh, either here or on the web are, in fact, self-reps, but there's an interesting, um, I think, blind spot uh, that uh, has been touched upon that I think needs to be elaborated upon, which is the following. An unbundled service is defined in the uh, rules of professional conduct as part but not all of a traditional service. Now, one of the things that lawyers have traditionally never provided is coaching. The whole theory is that you come to the lawyer to do the doing. If you're a self-rep, you're going to be doing the doing so that there's a distinction. It falls under the category, I think, under the umbrella of unbundled services, but there's a distinction for uh, litigants who are going to be doing it themselves that when they buy a piece of a service, that is the drafting of a document, uh, some correspondence, whatever, that they should feel comfortable asking the lawyer how do I then do the next piece by myself? Talk about the strategy. Talk about what is the judge going to be genuinely interested in hearing from me as opposed to me telling the judge everything that I want to unburden myself 
with. That's not necessarily going to be helpful. So this whole concept of coaching is something which, uh, if I can use the analogy, we've all heard the phrase, if you want to help a hungry person, uh, you don't give them a fish, you teach them how to fish. That's what coaching is. Uh, unbundled services is selling fish. Uh, the distinction is something that is only uh, beginning to emerge in a fairly clear way because we as the profession always felt you would come to us to do the thing in court. And now that that situation is being uh, altered in the dynamic of the self-represented litigant, uh, we're beginning to talk about coaching, which is why the uh, family, <laughs> uh, the, the family law limited uh, scope services uh, project uh, uh, has uh, started to do coaching, has already done coaching, and is starting to do coaching, and hopefully more and more lawyers are going to do it. I raise it in this particular context. If you happen to be a self-rep out there, ask about coaching. Ask about how you are going to handle yourself when you speak to a judge. Ask what happens in front of a judge. Ask what the courtesies are. Ask what your role is going to be, what's expected of you. And if the lawyer you speak with is going to focus only on delivering you the affidavit or the case conference brief and that's the end of it, then if, with all due respect, go to one of the other lawyers who are listed on FLIS who is going to be interested in providing you with that ongoing coaching. So there is well, that distinct, d distinction. Yeah, I, I, so one of the things that's important there, though, is that there is no, there's no sort of one size fits all. There will be some people who can manage, you know, if they have a, an adequate or, or a good statement of claim, and they can identify the issues from that, right? They can identify the issues they have with their opponent from that, that they'll be able to guide themselves through the rest of the, rest of the way. Um, there'll be other people who need a lot more, and I think that's where it comes in. Now, I wanted to turn a bit to Noel, because I know Noel has an interest in, in sort of what the regulators are doing, and we're going to go a little out of order on our, our scripted questions here, because I think it's something that um, is an important thing. Noel, let's talk about the role of the regulator in ensuring the public's ability to attain justice in a timely and efficient manner, right? Thank you, Janice. Yes, you got five minutes. I, I think it's. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I'll uh, I'll respect that. Uh, so I think it's an important question to ask, right? Because the reality is that the overwhelming majority of people who are self-represented litigants do not want to be self-represented litigants. Um, most people want to be represented litigants. Most people want someone to catch the fish for them. I mean, if you think of everyone who eats fish. What percentage of those people are actually good fisher people uh, or want to be fisher people? It's the same is true, I think, of self-represented litigants. And I think uh, we need to ask questions about the decisions which are made in this very building, which have consequences for self-represented litigants, which have consequences for the availability of high-quality legal assistance to, to people who want it. So, uh, so this slide, I thought this was going to build slide by slide, but anyway, I'll just do the whole thing. Uh, there, are, there are huge numbers of people out there who um, have unmet legal needs, right? Most self-represented litigants, I think, I would describe as people who have unmet legal needs, people who want to acquire legal services but are unable to do so, typically because they can't afford them. But then we also have huge crowds of people in Ontario who want to help them, who want to provide individual partisan legal assistance to people confronting legal problems. Uh, but who are unable to do so, right? And they're unable to do so for, for regulatory reasons. Uh, so for, I'm thinking here, first of all, of paralegals who are still excluded from all family law practice in Ontario. Three or four years after a major commission recommended this, two years after the Law Society dedicated itself to the idea of bringing paralegals into family law, it still hasn't happened. Uh, there's also lots of people, and I see this because I sit on an admissions committee at a law school, uh, people who would like to be lawyers but can't afford the time and cost investment to become a lawyer. It costs, uh, like tuition is $20,000 a year at least in, a, in an Ontario law school. It takes three years, lots of foregone income. People from uh, you know, modest backgrounds simply can't stomach that type of career investment. There's also lots of people who are willing to make that investment and apply to law school but can't get in. We're very, very strict, right? And Windsor Law is not the strictest law school in terms of admission in the province by a long shot. 
but we still routinely turn people away. And you read their applications, you look at their grades, and you think, maybe these people wouldn't be able to you know, revolutionize the law through Supreme Court advocacy, but they're more than capable of providing partisan high quality assistance to someone going through um, uh, the average divorce. Uh, then there's all the people who, who go, are trained abroad, right? I'm involved with the Global Lawyers of Canada group, which represents uh, people who have gone to law school outside of Canada, usually because they can't get in here. They come back, uh, and it's like a four or five year odyssey to try to go through these um, NCA exams, um, it, just, to, just to have the right to, to practice law. So, so this is a wall, right? We have various wall, ladders over this wall that can get people licensed to provide these services that are so desperately needed. The traditional pathway, you know, with uh, you know, get your JD degree, find articles, and so forth. Foreign trained law lawyer pathway. Uh, and the progress we've seen is that there are a few more ladders than there used to be, right? We have the law practice program. We do have paralegals being allowed to provide certain things. But I think we need to be critical about this, about this regime. And we need to think really hard about whether we can make these ladders wider, whether we can have more ladders, whether we can do anything else to help the, uh, the supply of people who want to help be allowed to meet the demand. Now, this doesn't mean getting rid of regulation, right? Getting over this wall does not mean you're unregulated. We still need a, a licensing regime. We still need a regulatory regime. But, but licensing is a very particular type of regulatory regime, and it's one that places very high burdens and barriers in front of people before they can even start to offer services. Uh, and I think um, the law society has come a certain way, but we're not there yet. And I think, uh, maybe we'll have time to talk about this later, but uh, we have to recognize that we have a self-regulated legal profession. And when you have lawyers making decisions about licensing, and those lawyers have personal financial skin in the game, then we as a public need to be a little bit skeptical and a little bit critical. Uh, if, if I were a practicing family lawyer and I was on the committee designing the scope of practice for paralegals and family law, I think I might have to recuse myself from that because someone who practices family law and makes money from it has a very direct pecuniary interest in the question of how much competition they will have from lower priced paralegals. Really going to have to take an issue here. The, the the family law bar is being demonized in this discussion. The family law bar is contributing to the law society's consideration of this very issue. There are many family lawyers who have a um, have have gone above and beyond to work on numerous access to justice issues, including the unbundled services support for legal aid, which is being reduced left, right, and center. Um, there are lawyers and paralegals that make decisions for the Law Society. Some might say that maybe paralegals have a vested interest in that decision. I mean, I, I'm not trying to prejudge the outment, but there's a lot of judgment there. I think family lawyers have a lot of experience that is being ignored in this discussion. We have experience working with legal assistants. We have a, a, uh, experience working with law students articling students and clerks, um, and I, I don't, I have to object to the tone of those so remarks. So let's, let's talk about then, um, and, and what I'm taking from what Noel's saying, I, I take your point, I do think family lawyers get a bad rap in terms of um, what they can do for people who otherwise can't afford legal representation. The, um, but let's talk about the way in which regulation um, uh, tends toward, and this is something Joel and I were talking about, regulation tends toward that rules-bound approach instead of an approach to, instead of an approach that says, how can we get services to people? And I think you've done a lot of work on that, Tammy. I mean, it's, it's a focus of your career. How can we get services to people? But that's really what we're about today, this morning. And I'm how does that no no but how does that tie in with how the regulator regulates access to the profession because that's what i'm taking from what joel says right and i mean we have access to justice reports we have lots of good recommendations some of which have been acted on some of which that haven't we're now in an environment that anything that costs money is sometimes not even considered and sometimes incredibly difficult to accomplish 
Um, I, I just think that um, the, the regulator is looking at this issue. The other piece we haven't even touched on is websites. You have websites run by non-lawyers and non-paralegals which give a divorce for $99, which dramatically impact people's rights and obligations. Um, so I think that, as I said before, the landscape is changing and it's always challenging for um, people, the regulator, the insurer, the courts, like we're all trying to catch up and figure out how to help. But um, I, I, I think that the, we, we have to be cautious in terms of how to help while still protecting the public and also recognizing the importance of the rights and obligations that are being discussed. You get a divorce, that impacts your estates legal rights and obligations, it in, in, um, impacts your insurance claims. Like the, these are significant things and by pushing a button on WeVorce and saying I want to get a divorce, do people even understand that they are dramatically changing their rights and obligations when they commit to doing so? So there are resources out there that are, are um, number one, there's a lot of moving parts to develop the resources, which I think is what you're telling me. There's insurance, there's regulation, there's the resource itself. Um, in addition, you've got uh, resources that perhaps are dangerous for people to use. Well, and I think that the regulator has to look at this from, a, from con considering the competing concerns. Access to justice is a concern. Protection of the public is a concern. It, it, I just don't think it's so simple to say open the floodgates. I think that you need um, a um, principled and, and policy-driven approach to how you do these. And we're not the only jurisdiction that's looking at this. You have a number of jurisdictions in the States and in Canada that have tried different things, some of which have worked and some of which haven't. So I'm not saying that we need to do better and that there isn't room for doing better. But the, the throwing people under the bus for being just too conservative, um, I, I think that um, is not a realistic view of how those of us in the system are working very hard to grapple with these very issues. I think, I think what I take more from Noel's um, um, answer or Noel's portion of the discussion actually is that he is passionate about these issues. I think you're, you're sort of working towards the same thing from a different side, right? Each from a different side. And that takes us on to the next question, really. Um, I know, Noel, you wanted to respond perhaps to Tammy, but does it have to do with our next question, which is the role the regulator has <coughs> in ensuring the public's abilities to attain justice? Yes, yeah, so I, I just want to say I, I completely agree that when it comes to websites and technology, uh, it's not there yet, right? I mean, people still need a live human body helping them. It has to be a regulated live human body. The insurance regime is very important. The code of conduct is very important. My focus is on licensing in particular, right, which is a, a, a specific regulatory technique. And I also agree with Tammy that it's not just about price, right? I think we need a, a, a consumer interest framework. Right? Whenever we make regulation, whenever we decide who can do what or what the rules are going to be, we have to bear in mind the consumers have interests in high quality services, in affordable price, and in an informed choice. So I think what we need is an evidence-based, ob objective regulatory design. And I think it's, uh, my only point is that when the law society is doing that, when a self-regulatory organization is doing that, uh, it's very important to avoid both the reality and the appearance of a system which is done behind closed doors and which places too much power in the hands of people who have a vested financial interest in the outcome. So let's move on, because I know this is supposed to focus on resources for people. Um, and we have talked a bit about unbundled legal services. Yeah, talk to me, uh, Heather, about how yours in particular improves uh, access to justice when you offer unbundled legal services through the self-rep navigators? Um, so, oh, sorry. So the self-rep navigators, um, we actually are com composed of both family and uh, civil lit lit litigators. Um, and um, what I do, myself in particular, is um, I, I realized very early on that I am not a litigator type of personality, so, um, and that's kind of one of my weakness, but my strength is that I feel that I can connect with people, I understand where, uh, what clients are thinking. So what I do is I offer a two-tier system. Um, I am the, basically like the, uh, the legal educator, 
um, yes. in, in a team. So I would be um, like the intake and I listen to the client's story, I take in the facts, um, and I would take my client to the, the expert, the legal advice lawyer. So um, I've done this with a, a few of my um, of the self rep navigators and it's been, it's been very good. Um, the clients are, um, they, I mean, they, they appreciate that, that they have two lawyers. Um, and what I try to do is because I'm, I'm on the, the, the level of uh, non-practicing, um, so I don't have to pay as much to the, to the law society for the license fee, and I try to reflect that in my pricing. So uh, if they just want something explained or they, they want to understand the process, um, that's what I'm for. But as for legal advice, like specific advice, um, they would have to receive that, obviously, from the, my legal advice um, pers uh, partner that I work with. Um, and I also find this is interesting as well because sometimes clients don't just need lawyers. They, they need mediators. Um, and so I would, again, be the go-between. So I'm kind of like this uh, sort of middle person. Um, I'm, uh, I would kind of look at the case in a more like a holistic view. Um, so it's not just legal, um, legal, the legal side. Uh, there's also perhaps uh, may maybe, they, maybe they need to see um, some, uh, maybe there's mental health uh, issues involved. Uh, I will see if I can connect them to a mental health expert if that's required. So, so I'm kind of like the hub. Um, but um, sort of going back to your question, so mm -hmm. how, how does it help? So um, I remember, uh, so when I was a self-rep, um, I was really lucky because I, I have some legal knowledge. I have some, I was going to school, going to Oscar at the time. Uh, and so I kind of basically know roughly how the legal system works. But a lot of my clients, a lot of people, they have no idea. I mean, they, have, they, they do have ideas, actually, sorry. They have, they have wrong ideas about how the legal system works. And, and sometimes um, it's interesting because it's, uh, you kind of have to unseat them from these assumptions. Um, I think a lot of clients, they come in, myself included, um, we come in with the, with the mindset that we are going to win. We are in the right. The judge is a reasonable person, and we are 100% sure that the judge will see things our way. And it's really, really hard to get out of that. So when you're involved in a conflict, it's really hard to get out of that. Um, and uh, so I, I find that um, part of my job is to kind of explain how the legal system actually works. And so that's where the legal education side comes in, is because you don't want clients to have unrealistic expectations. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a wonderful common law system, but um, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean just, just because you have a just system, it doesn't mean that you're always going to get a result that's favorable to your side. But that's really hard to, to, to educate someone. And I think sometimes, I know one of the problems is, uh, I know that when I was a client, um, sometimes clients don't trust their own lawyers. Sometimes clients will say, well, my lawyer is just doing this for a living. He, he really or she really doesn't care about my case. She, they don't really care about justice. They just want to milk me. So when you get that, when you have a client with that mindset, they're kind of not really wanting to listen to, the, to, to their own lawyer's advice. And so this is another reason why I, I want to offer that layer of a neutral, neutral um, legal education. I, so I, can, I would say to them, I would say to people, invite people, you know, come out to my talks. It's for everyone. It's not just for your case. So when it's in information that's delivered that way, like it's not coming from your lawyer who's got an interest in milking you. If it's coming from just, you know, I'm speaking at the Toronto Reference Library. This is information that's applicable to everyone. You're much more receptive to, to, to open your mind and to go, oh, okay, this is not how the legal system works. Kind of, oh, I cannot just go to the judge and plead and yell and scream or whatever, or 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 speak in um, a whole bunch of uh, use a whole bunch of moral philosophical language and hope to move the judge, because I think sometimes people go, well, you know, justice prevails, and that's a very strong faith that we have as litigants. But um, I think when you're a litigant and when you don't know better, when you don't know that, well, wait a second, this is not how the legal system works. I mean, there's such a thing called stereotesis, but you don't want to hear that from your lawyer and you don't want to pay $300 an hour to listen to your lawyer preach to, or not preach, but 
you know, educate you, um, I feel that this layer, this, this more neutral layer of legal, legal education is kind of where it could play a role. But uh, sort of um, going back, uh, just to summarize, um, so I find that in order to complement legal, legal advice, whether it's coaching, which, is, which, is, which I love, because I, I wish that I could have some coaching when I was uh, a litigant, uh, or whether it's task, actually the, the lawyers actually say ghost writing. So ghost writing is another wonderful you know, piece of a, a service that, that lawyers can deliver, or even just specific representation. I don't know how you call it, like, you know, where a lawyer just comes to that specific hearing for you. Attending on events. Attending on events. So that's, yeah, so um, I, I love all these services, but I always feel that um, a, a client will have so much more confidence in what you're providing if they actually understand the process itself. Like if they understand that, you know, what, like I, I know that I really loved what my lawyer did because I was in law school. I knew how difficult it was to draft legal arguments. I loved what he did for me. I, I just really appreciated what he did. And I could see the beauty of, of, of his work. And, and I, mean, just, I just really want, I wish that more people would be able to experience that. So yeah, I think that Heather was, has been very innovative in this area of doing workshops. Um, there are other examples as well. There's, um, there are two family lawyers in Toronto who do a private a fee-based uh, group education. There's the mandatory information program, which is not just law, but it's also process and um, links to referrals for every family case, at least in the Superior Court. Um, the, I don't like the suggestion about clients not having confidence in their lawyers. I think that, that um, to me, it, when I was in private practice, if my clients were saying that, I would always say to them, why don't you get another opinion? Like, if this isn't working for you. So I, I don't think that we should be accepting that as appropriate or the norm in client-lawyer relationships. Um, clients aren't always happy about paying the fees, but to me, if, if my client felt like they were being milked or, or didn't understand the process, I, I would say there was something seriously wrong in that solicitor-client relationship. I think, I think what happens, though, is that um, to some extent, and I was going to ask Joel about this, to some extent, once the, once the person enters the lawyer-client relationship, um, there can be a large surrender of control and that can be very difficult for people. Um, it breeds resentment, mm -hmm. number one, and it perpetuates the notion that um, lawyers are alienating, an alienating sort of person by their nature, mm -hmm. um, which gives rise to more self-represented litigants. That's one of the reasons why I'm so pleased to hear about Joel's and Heather's effort, efforts in innovations in service delivery because it's important that people, people know that the courts are there to serve them, right? It is, it is not supposed to be this sort of mystical place where everything's so hard to navigate. And I was gonna ask Joel about that. Do you find that you're, you're really handing back a lot of control to people as you are coaching and talking to them and helping them through particularly the family law process, but it works for any legal process? Absolutely, I don't think this is unique to the family law. It just happens to be uh, the area that I practice, but, but absolutely. Um, the traditional model of lawyering, uh, which I think has been around for, uh, I don't know, 723 years, something like that, uh, is that, hi, I'm a lawyer. Uh, the transaction is that you are going to c deliver to me your money, your purse, uh, and your problem, and I will deliver to you and your bag of documents, and I'm going to deliver to you the solution. And uh, it's important that you respect me because I have all of the education, knowledge, and wisdom to get through the maze uh, to get you to the end. Uh, I, I've th thought that that's, uh, with all due respect to all of us, including myself, uh, you need to be pretty arrogant if you're going to practice uh, any kind of barristing, uh, barristering. Uh, you need to have a lot of confidence and arrogance comes along with that and we convey that to people. Uh, what I like to try to do, certainly with the family law coach, and I believe this seeps into coaching anybody. I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about people who embrace this kind, this kind of practice, is you reverse the model. You say, no, 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 no. I'm going to respect you, the consumer. You're the consumer, the purchaser of services, and I am merely the provider of services. What service do you want? What is the service 
that has value to you? How much of uh, your resources are you prepared to spend to get what? And now that I know what you're prepared to spend and what you want for it, I'm going to provide it. So the shift in paradigm is for the lawyer to uh, uh, recognize that the relationship is one in which uh, she or he needs to respect the interests and needs of the client. It's not so much the lawyer valuing my time, I set the hourly rate, I set how many hours you need, that's the fee, because it, that's how much I figure I'm worth. It's the other side of the coin, how much, uh, what service do you want that uh, continues to have value for you. Coaching tends to do that. It tends to drag us out of our um, I know it all and I'm going to do it all uh, approach to how can I be of assistance uh, to you. So this is, uh, again, this is something that's very, very new. Um, uh, most jurisdictions in North America are, haven't heard of it or aren't, aren't doing it and I, so much credit goes to uh, what, um, what Tammy and uh, what we're doing, beginning to do in Ontario. But yes, to me, control is the element. I have found, I'll give this one example, if I may, I start by selling a one or two hour package of time. That's all I ask you to buy, one hour or two hours. People inevitably, well, not inevitably, I don't know, 94% of the people buy the two hour package of time to get started. Uh, they wouldn't lay out $1,500 for a retainer to a lawyer. They wouldn't lay out $2,000 for a retainer to the lawyer. They end up on average, the average file that I have ends up spending 12 hours. I've taken out those files that spend way, way more. So now you have clients who wouldn't dream of going to the lawyer to spending an extreme amount of $1,500 end up spending a significant, uh, three times that. Because if they see value and if they can control the amount of time that is being spent and they can say an extra two hours is going to give me this because this is what I want. Uh, it's a very it, client-centered approach. Yeah. It, it, and it is shifting the respect. And frankly, uh, I, I, I hate to say this, it took me so long, it took me almost 50 years uh, to, to do this. Uh, I used to think that the person whose respect I most needed was a senior partner in my firm who would look at my billings. And it's uh, happily, uh, I've shifted to thinking the person whose respect I most need is the client who I'm supposed to be having. So, so it, it's the client maintains responsibility for the file or the dispute, because of course this isn't re uh, restricted to litigation. Okay. Um, and so, you know, the retainer can assign responsibility for certain issues or tasks to the client, okay. um, to the lawyer, I mean. Um, but also but the client ma maintains the client control. Yeah. So the client is, is in the driver's seat about saying, well, you know, I understand what your fee is or your hourly rate is. How much time is it going to take for you to prepare my materials for the motion or for you to coach me before a settlement conference? And so uh, the client is, is able to use their resources more effectively to accomplish what they're prioritizing as their needs. And while I absolutely accept that most of us are not fishermen, I mean, I, I really get that. Uh, but. Uh, we, we, we need to look at, we need to look differently at self reps than the way that we do. Self reps are people who are in our system. Judges have to deal with self reps over and over. And mediators. And uh, judges yeah. and mediators, right. and I apologize, yeah. absolutely mediators. Our over dream. and over, and we have sets of <laughs> rules, etc. It is so helpful to the system, it is so helpful to the traditional lawyers, it is so helpful to the court staff, incredibly helpful to the people whose lives are at issue here, if we can give them a way of navigating the system so that they can feel, A, that they've been respected, obviously, and B, that they can be effective, because people, whatever you do, if you're not a lawyer, you're not a lawyer. I mean, it's just as simple as that. I couldn't drive a bus. I go into buses all the time. I couldn't drive a bus. Most people aren't lawyers. And if they're not lawyers, when they come into a system governed by lawyers, where the rules are for lawyers, and where the people who are playing the system are lawyers, and the adjudication is done by judges who are lawyers, it's an alien system. If we give them help, then we help absolutely providing access to justice. The truth of the matter is access to justice without access to services is a, ga a game. 
there is no access to justice if there's no access to services. All right. Thank you. Now, Heather, um, uh, I, did, I have a web question here as to whether the Self-Rep Navigator Group is currently accepting new lawyer members on its civil litigation roster. Um, I have given you the person's name, um, but are you, uh, do you uh, anticipate taking on further lawyers or colleagues? Um, yes, so I have... <laughs> I have just um, consulted with my senior member here, Joel Miller, and, and he has granted me permission to, <laughs> to, no, I'm just kidding. Um, yes, of course, we always welcome um, new members. Um, so when I said just now that we used to meet in person, that was fun, but then I real we realized that that was excluding a lot of people um, uh, in the perhaps the further the farther parts of Ontario, so definitely yes, we are accepting new members. And uh, if you go to, uh, you can just Google self rep navigators. Just you know, Google self rep navigators. Um, but the actual URL is also fairly um, memorable. It's uh, www.limitedscoperetainers.ca. I, sh I should say, to any, oh. of the to any of the lawyers that are interested, we now meet digitally so that you don't have to be uh, in, in any particular area. We meet online through Zoom so everybody can see each other and uh, it can be anywhere in the province. Excellent, that's right. So we, we just, uh, we, are inno we are innovative. <laughs> um, and so we've gone to Zoom, I think a couple times now, and we're gonna continue going uh, meeting on Zoom. Um, and the meetings are generally around one and a half hours to two. Um, in general, they are, um, uh, they, uh, you can claim them as uh, for CPD. Uh, generally, usually it's uh, for the substantive credit. Um, but um, next year, so I'm already planning programs for next year, uh, and uh, one of the programs is going to be, um, I guess the title will be something like client-centered practice. What is that? <laughs> so I'm thinking of inviting some um, former clients or self-represented litigants um, to come and be guest speakers um, on the, in the meeting. Uh, I should say, though, uh, there's an annual fee of $25, um, so I w we're just trying to keep fees as low as possible so that everyone can join. Um, and yeah, is there anything else, Joe? Okay, that's yeah. it, yeah. All right, I have a really quick question for Tammy. Um, is the coaching training open to non-lawyers in the family law field or is that lawyers only? Um, that's a good question. Um, I can ask the, our trainer, uh, Lisa Eisen, who has picked up this work from Nikki Gershmain. Oh, who developed yeah, right. the coaching curriculum. My understanding is that, or my assumption is that it was tr developed for lawyers, but that doesn't mean that she wouldn't necessarily do one for non-lawyers. Non um, I just don't know enough about the specifics. All right, thank you. I wanted to get back to Noel, um, because we've had some good discussion on how uh, coaching and unbundling can assist with access to justice. Um, but there's a question here that's sort of specific for Noel. Building on your analysis of <coughs> litigation and settlement mechanisms used to resolve disputes, can you highlight the costs and benefits for the children involved? Right, so that's, uh, that's a really interesting question. And it's something that makes family law distinct, right? In that we have children who are, who are third party to the litigation process, despite some mechanisms we have to hear their voice. Uh, and yet the children's interests doc doctrinally are supreme, right? The best interest of the child standard is the golden rule of any family law case in involving children. And it's interesting because on the one hand, children have a very strong interest in security, obviously, right? In financial security, in physical security, in, in living in homes which are free from violence of any kind. Um, and, and, and that's something the system pursues, right? That's a doctrinal focus of family law, is, is trying to, you know, have support mechanisms and, uh, and an approach to domestic, domestic violence in particular, which try to guarantee the financial and physical security of children. But then we also know that, you know, children are, are well served by settlement and by an absence of conflict. So, so in, in a way, trying to serve the interests of children pushes the system in two directions. Like on the one hand, it pushes us towards rigorous settlement promotion on the theory that if we can just get these things out of court, just get any type of settlement between parents involving a divorce, that's good for children. On the other hand, when we push too far in that direction, we could start losing track of, of the need to protect children's interests in financial and physical security. So, uh, so I mean, it's, it's a good thing we have such talented 
hardworking people in family law because uh, that's uh, that's a really tough circle to square. Thank you. Um, I wanted to make sure we left some time for questions. We're doing quite well at the moment. Um, the I'm out of my notes. Just a moment. <laughs> Did everybody get a copy of the resource sheet? That was what I wanted to ask. The resource sheet that um, we had put together. Where's <coughs> Chloe? I think it might be available on the front desk. Is it available on the sign-in desk, Chloe? Excellent. And yes, what, if I can just add too, um, yeah. the, the court connected media, family mediation services aren't on this list. Um, for those of you who have anything to deal with family law clients, you should be aware of those. They are available, at least to some extent, in every jurisdiction in Ontario. Um, they're very, very affordable. So the on-site services are free uh, for a limited assistance. The off-site services are either free or geared to income on a very modest basis. So our court-connected mediators are fantastic. Um, many are um, experts in the parenting field, and so that's a really good resource. Um, that was left off, omitted from the list. All right, thank you. Um, and I see that we do have the resource sheet available on the sign-in desk. And I take it, Chloe, we have that available as an electronic version as well for people on the web. Um, let's talk about um, other tools and services <coughs> that can be implemented to facilitate improvements um, to the licensing process or the regulatory process to facilitate further innovation in service delivery. And I'm going to ask you to brainstorm a little and blue sky a little. Let's start with you, Tammy. I'll challenge your brain there. Um, I think there's a p a potential for greater involvement of law students. Uh, unfortunately, we um, just had the cancellation of the pro bono students family law project at some of our courts, like 393 University, because there's no more duty council to supervise them. Um, but there's an area where I think there's room. Uh, I see two of my friends and colleagues who um, are family counsel to law student clinics. Um, I think law students um, have, have a lot to contribute and that there's some room there. Um, and uh, we know that the family law project that PBSC runs is very well received where it's operational. So I think that that is certainly an area, and I know that there have been some amendments to um, the law society rules in, in recent years to facilitate that. Right. Do you see other uh, innovations in service delivery, Joel, that can, that can assist self-represented litigants with navigating the system? Yeah, th yes, I do. There's, uh, there's one which uh, I personally have fallen in, lo in, in love with uh, uh, that originated in Omaha uh, called the Domestic Relations uh, uh, Informal, trial. Informal Trial. Thank you very much. And uh, that actually was begun by judges uh, who suggested it uh, downward. And what that is is a project, again, this is in family law, uh, in which they say, um, we're not gonna have lawyers. Lawyers can come into the room, but they uh, aren't the people who are gonna be speaking. Uh, you have two hours to hear a case. Uh, there aren't going to be any rules of evidence or <coughs> procedure. The judge is gonna control it. If you wanna pick up your cell phone and show pictures of your kids or whatever, you can do it. Uh, you can't cross-examine the other party, but you can say to the judge, uh, ask him about the time that he showed up to pick the kids drunk. Um, you can, uh, uh, you have an opportunity to tell your story. The other side has the opportunity of telling their story. As I say, uh, you can ask the judge to intervene. The judges are quite interventionist. The role of a lawyer um, uh, there are lawyers before the hearing who will provide unbundled services to explain what's going to be happening inside. And a lawyer can speak uh, for certain, uh, certain kinds of issues, but typically it's for the client. Uh, and the uh, result uh, of uh, the, the decision, the result of that hearing, is typically given later that day uh, or the following day. And they have found a number of very, uh, it's, it's an opt-in system. Both sides have to opt into it. So uh, 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 
in theory, the, both sides could have a lawyer, even though when they show up, it's the individuals who are going to be speaking. In most cases, it's, uh, it's uh, mainly uh, self-reps. But what they found, amongst other things, was if there was not a traditional uh, adversarial cross-examination project, a lot of the mud, a lot of the anger and hostility tends uh, not to come out because I'm not now cross-examining the other side about all of the evil, nasty things. I tend to be trying to use my time to convince the judge about uh, why I'm the better parent, uh, why I'm a good parent. Um, this has not been picked up overwhelmingly. Curiously enough, we have a society in which uh, uh, even with uh, even with self reps, there is the feeling that uh, they want to have a traditional system, which absolutely exists. So this is not a replacement in any way, shape, or form, but uh, uh, just as collaborative law is a way of taking negotiating settlements out of uh, court, uh, this is a way of uh, uh, resolving matters in court in a less hostile and adversarial uh, way. So way. Newfoundland has been doing this now for two years, a version of it. Um, and uh, we're waiting on some data to see. Uh, we hear anecdotally that it's been going quite well, but we're waiting for some data to see mm -hmm. what the uptake has been, um, whether those waivers have been enforced on appeal, because right. often a family, right. one of the family clients is potentially unhappy after a decision is rendered, and so there are some kind of due process -y concerns. But um, there are a handful of those programs across North America, mm -hmm. uh, and Newfoundland's the only Canadian one that I'm aware of. Now, Noel, you said you had, you had some thoughts on, on this item about other things we can do. Yeah, so I am very impressed by England and Wales. Uh, in terms of regulating legal services in a manner that maximizes access to justice. Uh, so a few features of the, of the English system. Uh, first of all, advice giving does not require a license in England and Wales. So if you want to give legal advice, you're not representing someone or acting on their behalf, you're giving them advice. That behavior is regulated but does not require a license. You don't have to surmount that onerous brick wall in order to do so. Uh, and that's really created a, a great diversity of, uh, of technological and other and, and, and free and pro bono opportunities for people to get advice that don't exist here for regulatory reasons. They also allow alternative business structures, which is to say that lawyers and non-lawyers can collaborate. Again, not without regulation, but they don't have the what's effectively the prohibition that we have here on business structures uh, involving lawyers and non-lawyers uh, working in a corporate way. Uh, finally, um, the, uh, they have multiple legal professions, right? There's seven or eight independently regulated groups. There's a, a, a structure which oversees all of them, uh, but there's just many more opportunities for people to get professional regulated assistance because, uh, because of, of the existence of so many different professional groups. Also mentioned very quickly, something happening here in Canada, uh, in BC, the Civil Resolution Tribunal, a completely online tribunal for resolving small claims and condo disputes. I think this is the most exciting thing to happen in Canadian civil procedure in 10 or 20 years. Um, and I think we need our own civil resolution tribunal here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to, um, I think we've covered a lot of the material that we had decided we would try to cover today in terms of how to help people get access to the system and use it effectively. Yes, Joel. Janice, if, if I might, can I return for just a moment to the issue of regulation? Sure. Uh, one of the things that uh, is interesting about regulation is uh, that regulation, de licensing deals with who can do, who are going to allow to do the thing. And regulation is um, uh, who, but how. And one of the things I found uh, interesting is the American Bar Association, uh, every bar association has rules of profession professional responsibility and conduct, and uh, as do we. And the American Bar Association, their uh, uh, rules of professional conduct, their very first rule deals with uh, the role of a lawyer. And one of the things that they state in their, they have a rule and commentary, and we have rules and commentary. One of the things they state in their commentary is that uh, uh, it is permissible for the lawyer to take into consideration the economic resources of the client mm -hmm. 
when considering the extent and degree of the delivery of legal services. So if you back up just a minute, we start with saying, as do they, that a responsible lawyer needs to do a whole bunch of legitimately understandable things. We need investigations, backup, we have to look at documents, we have to, there's a whole bunch of things we do. That creates a regulatory, that's one of the bricks in that regulatory wall, which says that if you have a big complex matter, there's a bunch of things that we have to do. And if you have a simple matter, we still have to do a bunch of these things, which sometimes become so costly that in fairness, uh, I'm just a simple, I have a simple access issue. Uh, how much background research, if I say to you, these are the facts, can't you just accept those facts? The advantage of, the, of saying out loud that you can take into consideration the ec economic resources, the financial resources of the client pushes the delivery of uh, services into uh, different areas for those with modest means as compared to those with lavish means. And uh, I want to be polite about this, but I don't know how many years it's been since we've had a really, really good look at our particular rules. Our rules are great for the law that used to be, but it seems to me that as a part of regulation, it would be helpful to take more cognizance of the fact that there are people involved with personal plight issues, immigration, landlord and tenant, family law, uh, all kinds of matters where the full formal regulatory requirement makes a little, I won't say makes less sense since they can't afford it we don't give them the service, why can't we arrange it so that if you can't afford it, we can still give them the service? So that's something that I think um, uh, can be and should be looked into. And I know that there are people, and Mr. Mercer is here, and I've heard him speak on this as well, and I, I, I know that there are people who are beginning to think of this, and if you look at it from the consumer end, mm -hmm. uh, you see things differently. Differently. I'm gonna move on just because we're approaching the point where I'd like to uh, take some questions from all of you good people in the room. Um, uh, our final question is what is the role of decision makers uh, and their limitations? And it ties in with a question from the internet, um, uh, which is, does the panel have any advice on general best practice for lawyers when the opposing party is a self-represented litigant? Um, I can tell you right now, I don't give legal advice anymore because I don't practice anymore, which means I'm not insured. But I'm happy to share tips and tricks. So with that disclaimer, <laughs> the, um, I've been judging small claims for 23 years now. Um, and I've developed a number of techniques to assist self-represented litigants. The first thing is there's a bit of a dividing line between uh, providing assistance with procedure or common courtesy, as it's known in the legal world, um, and actually providing advice on how to conduct the case. Obviously, when you're a lawyer, you cannot provide the other side with advice on how to conduct the case because you have a client that you have to work for. Um, and that's something, that's the first thing that should be explained to the self-represented litigant. I think it's a courtesy to that person to say, you know, I'm here, I'm a human being. If you have a question about rules, right, no problem. If you have a question about how to win your case, I can't answer that one because I have to work for my client, right? Um, and I think the same goes largely uh, for the fact finders in the room. There's been quite a bit of jurisprudence, actually, both the Court of Appeal for Ontario, I think, and the Supreme Court of Canada have indicated that fact finders, judicial officers, um, I always call it fact finders, I suppose law appliers as well, um, judicial officers are intended to assist self-represented litigants as best they can, particularly with procedural issues or rules-based things without, quote, and this is one of those archaic legal terms, descending into the fray, um, which sort of 
means nothing to anybody who uh, was born in the 20th or 21st centuries the, <laughs> without, without becoming partisan, I suppose, right? For example, one of my earlier cases, I, I'd probably been sitting as a deputy judge for maybe a couple of years, and um, uh, the lawyer was, uh, or pardon me, the self-represented litigant was cross-examining a witness um, and a couple of times I stopped and said, no, you're supposed to be asking questions about that witness's evidence. You know, you're not supposed to be giving your evidence, I'll hear your evidence in a bit, um, but you should be asking questions such as, and I gave a couple of questions, <laughs> and then I went that step too far and said, well, you might want to ask him about this in that area. And of course, the lawyer for the other party hopped up and said, look, you know, when it comes to suggesting questions, okay, but new areas of cross-examination I don't need. <laughs> so, and that's fair. I mean, that's, that's becoming a little bit partisan, and I'm there as a judge. But I think it's true, too, of the lawyer who's up against the self-represented litigant. It's very important to be courteous. It's very important to be human. And it's very important to explain that to your client before you go in the room, right? Because one of the things you have to try and do uh, with the self-represented litigant is attain a settlement, right? You're not going to be able to attain a settlement if you've made an enemy of this person, if you've disrespected the person, if you haven't looked at it objectively to see um, whether or not or that they do actually have the kind of beef that you should be responding to or that your client should be responding to. Um, and I think those things are very important. I think self-represented litigants, largely, the ones I see, about 99 and 44 one hundredths percent of them come to court because they believe they have a legitimate grievance. I'm there as the small claims court judge um, to mediate and try to resolve a dispute. If I'm not there, if those people can't come to me, if they don't understand what they're doing, and if they can't come and make their um, um, positions known, then we don't serve society in the larger sense. Because without that mechanism, without that courtroom mechanism, adversarial or not, um, people tend to use baseball bats to settle their disputes. So in a way, um, assisting the self-represented litigant, going to the point of making sure they know where to sit, where to stand, when to serve a document, that kind of thing, uh, assists the rule of law. And that's a, an obligation we all have, both as lawyers uh, and as judicial officers, right? To support the rule of law and the administration of justice. So. I do my best to do that, bearing in mind that, you know, most of the self-represented litigants, you get the odd one who just likes to come to court, <laughs> but, you know, and you're sort of like, uh, you haven't told me anything I can help you with. I have a courtroom full of people, um, so I'm going to need to move on. But it's never the case that one should be looking at a self-represented litigant as some kind of threat or some kind of menace. They're really not. They're people who need someone to help them solve a problem. So that's what you do. And as the lawyer representing the client, so long as you're not helping that person win their case, I think you're good. Just make sure that that person is um, in the groove, as it were. Right? Do you think in family law it is a um, particularly challenging situation? And I'm not yeah. disagreeing no, with I anything agree. you said. Um, but often a represented client feels like they're being taken advantage of, particularly if the self-represented client is being not entirely reasonable in how they're proceeding. Um, and the represented client can often find that it becomes much more expensive than they ever anticipated because their lawyer is um, required to do so much more to educate and inform the other party. Um, I'm not saying that you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's part of the role and part of the situation that lawyers are finding themselves in more and more. The one thing that I've heard um, from lawyers who are dealing a lot with self-reps is that it helps to set out the communication rules early on in yes. the process. Yeah. Um, and now that everyone's emailing and Facebook messaging and whatever all the time, um, sometimes you have to set some ground rules with a self-rep to say, 
here's how is best to reach me. Um, you know, I, I'm, I may not be able to call you back immediately because the self-rep may have some expectations about how, you know, the lawyer will behave. So if you set those ground rules up early on in the relationship, that may make it easier if and when things get uh, hotly contested. Joel? What? There's another dimension to this. Uh, everybody is... At, at, there's a gazillion dimensions to this, so everything everybody has said <laughs> absolutely. is absolutely correct. There's, there's something else which uh, uh, always uh, stunned me when I was in uh, practice. Um, uh, there's, I like family law, and I like family law lawyers, and I think family law lawyers, generally speaking, are, are as a group, are really uh, nice people. But uh, there are Maybe some, there a but. Yeah. But, but there are some of us who f take zealous representation uh, uh, pretty far. Mm -hmm. And the disadvantage when you're dealing with a self-rep is you forget what happens after court mm -hmm. if you have been skating up to, and in too many cases going across the line of sharp practice. And uh, because of the nature of my practice, I only speak with self-reps, I, I am uh, severely disappointed with how often I hear stories of where someone was taken advantage of by a lawyer, and I wonder how that really helped that lawyer's client. So in response to uh, yeah, exactly. this piece of the answer to, to, that, uh, to, to, the, to that question is the following. You know, uh, Sun Tzu and his Art of War had a whole bunch of uh, really interesting principles, but one of which is you should not ever seek a complete victory. You should always uh, try to win uh, wisely. And uh, if you have uh, a, an access fight and you take uh, advantage of your skills and the inability of the self-rep to speak properly and correctly and this, that, and the other, and you end up getting a terrific uh, limited access, the other side has very limited access, you may end up damaging the children. If you end up getting a terrific support order, that's more than they can afford, all you end up getting is uh, FRO claims uh, where people are trying to make collections of, uh, for money that they're not uh, getting. So you have to ask yourself as a lawyer, now we're now talking about the question was a lawyer dealing with a self -help. you have to ask yourself, uh, correct, your job there is not to help the other person win, but you need to understand what a win is for your client and a complete victory smashing the other side so that they are trounced uh, and you dance out of court victoriously with how magnificent your cross-examination humiliated them leaves the situation, uh, leaves the family, can leave the family devastated. So. In dealing with a self rep, I come back to it. I mean, I, you, you need to pay, we as a profession need to pay respect to the self rep. You don't teach them how to win if you're on one side, but you have to ask yourself what kind of victory is going to help my client. And uh, uh, Tammy's point, absolutely, about the, how uh, these things can mushroom out of control. If if you take a more moderate position, and if you say to your client, I know he or she is a jerk, uh, but wait a second, let's start looking at this in the longer, uh, the longer view, uh, you can often end up uh, uh, approaching the self-rep in a way that she or he is not expecting, because they have views of us as, as lawyers, Absolutely. and they're not very complimentary. Uh, no. So if we can find ways of approaching them with uh, respect, keeping our clients' interests in mind and not being overly zealous, uh, we can end up helping families know. Okay, but, but Joel, like I, I'm going to, again, say that I don't think that that's the position that most family lawyers take. No and I think, it, frankly, it's the same with represented clients. If, if you have a, a, you know, I always said it took four to tango. If you have an unreasonable party on the other side, sometimes if you get too good of a win, they'll find a way to unravel it. So That's why I said this is just an aspect. Right, yeah, so I'm, I'm just saying that I think pieces. that, again, I, I I think that the family law community is very resolution focused and works very hard to bring about appropriate child focused resolution for their clients and, and there will always be people who don't necessarily do that but I don't want to have a, 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 a takeaway from this that the family bar is looking to bury the self reps because I, I don't think that that's true. But self reps yeah. have that view. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to 
close it there because Heather has something to say and then I want to move to the questions on this cue card because they're both very interesting. Go ahead, Heather. Okay, just very quickly. Um, two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Um, I just want to say that just because um, I'm co-founder of Self-Rep Navigation, uh, Self Navigate Association and I really care a lot about the rights of self-reps, uh, it doesn't mean that uh, I dismiss the, the rights of uh, represent a client, represented litigants is because um, a lot of times people who are self-represented, they switch back and forth. They can become represented clients the next day, right? Or they start representing or they, yeah. Right, so, uh, so I don't want to uh, get into this <coughs> mindset of us versus them represented versus, mm. versus uh, self-represented versus represented. At the end of the day, I um, echo what uh, actually both Tammy and Joel are saying, is that you need to balance um, you need to be uh, careful that you're being fair to both sides. And I know that sometimes it's really delicate because I know that if I'm a representative client and the other, the self rep is calling my lawyer mm -hmm. for legal education for an hour, who pays? This is a very difficult thing. I mean, because I know that as lawyers, yeah. you know, we have, we have this duty, right? But at the same time, then what we, we bill our clients I mean, can you imagine like if you're the representative client and you're saying you just gave a whole hour of legal education to my opponent, how much that hurts. So, and you know, and if you, I think that uh, as self reps as well, I think they should also be able to understand that because one day perhaps they will want to be uh, a representative client. So, but I think that if you kind of explain it that way, um, and you, as I, I, I totally agree. Um, so, Tammy, I absolutely agree that we sh you should set up some ground rules at the beginning and say, hey, you know what? Like, um, if you need more help, maybe go to uh, go to the MAG website for help. Uh, things like that. Go to Clio. Go to yeah. Step to Justice. And uh, I cannot be answering questions like this because this is not fair to my client. And yeah. Oh no, I certainly think that's true. There are limits to what you can do when you are, no, no, that, absolutely, and as I say, the first thing you have to do is explain it to your client, to say, look, the courts say that I do have an obligation to assist in procedural ways, oh no, absolutely, and you would not spend an hour on the phone educating your opponent. You would simply say, look, I can't do that because that's not fair, right? And it really does devolve to that. How, what feels fair to you, right? When you get to that little, tickle in the back of your neck that says, oh, I'm doing something here that maybe, you know, isn't too comfortable for me or may not be fair to my client. That's when you say, go to some of the resources. Mm -hmm. Or if you have an electronic version of our wonderful resource sheet, you can simply send it along. Um, I have a couple of interesting questions here um, from the audience. And I think the first one might be, might be best directed to Tammy because you're, you're working hard on these things. Are there any recent studies of who the litigants are in the family justice system, courts, uh, in terms of income and asset brackets, whether English is the first language, uh, and what percentage of cases involve allegations of domestic violence? So maybe one at a time. Are there studies of any of those things? So there, there are recent studies about self-represented litigants. Um, uh, doctors uh, Rachel Birnbaum and Nick Bala and Michael Saini have done some of the more recent stuff. Uh, it tends to focus more on the reason for self-representation um, and um, the self-represented litigants' perception with the process they find themselves in. Um, I'm not sure any of that deals specifically with the um, income issue, although I think Dr. McFarland's research does touch on that issue. Um, also, um, Alf Mamo um, in 2007 did a case file review of some Unified Family Court files and has some information, I think it was, it was um, uh, understanding the family courts. Anyways, um, there, there's some data there which is obviously a little bit old. Um, I don't think anyone has connected that to um, raising to um, concerns or claims being made related to domestic violence yet. I haven't seen that connection. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some domestic violence um, focused resources for um, self-represented and represented litigants. Uh, the Family Court Support Worker Program is available, again, to some extent, but at most locations in Ontario. Um, also, Luke's Place just um, last year, I think, launched a virtual legal advice clinic for domestic violence um, uh, survivors. 
Um, and then, of course, there are the tr services that have traditionally been provided by Luke's Place, Schleifer Clinic, um, and uh, legal aid. Uh, and this, uh, the area of domestic violence is one area that doesn't seem to have been overly impacted by the recent cuts yeah. in services. So um, just not that the research speaks to that, but... Yeah. yeah. Uh, Noel says he knows a study. Uh, yeah, just the work of John Paul Boyd and the Canadian Research yep. uh, Institute on Law and the Family is helpful on that. All right. <coughs> uh, because I think what, what they're really looking for in this question is demographics. And I'm not sure, every, like demographically, who are the income asset brackets that wind up self-represented? Who are those, right? Well, that, that's yeah. actually broken down very neatly in, in the McFarland and the National okay. Oh, is it in Dr. McFarland's work? Uh, okay. Page 29 or something like oh. that. Uh, oh. it's, it's, it's fascinating. It breaks down to education, age. I love the fact who, that you have a page number. Right? <laughs> who, 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 who's uh, the, the percentage of people, yes. uh, of men and women, who are uh, respondents and applicants? Uh, income spreads, and uh, frankly, the information is astonishing. If I'm correct, uh, uh, something like uh, almost half or more than half of the people have university education mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to a lesser. Uh, their income levels are much higher than uh, we would think. And uh, so, yes, that Well, that, also, that, that information, at. I think, contributed to some of the information that came from the Legal Innovation Zone, which talked about how much um, uh, how much resources there are available for professionals, for people who have some money to to address their legal, uh, their unmet legal needs, and I, I forget the number. It was it was a high number. Some might have found it kind of shocking, um, but I think it was the the income levels which led to that in terms of the potential unca uh, untapped market. Yes, yes. Now the other question was, how do we help people who can't afford uh, any services? and cannot get legal aid uh, any longer when general information is not sufficient. I, th I think really Heather and, and Joel are the best examples of that, right? The, uh, and I think unbundling actually is the best example of that. Yeah, the other thing is Clio, um, it's yeah. general information, but it is quite targeted. So I think even represented clients would uh, do themselves a favor by checking out Steps to Justice. Right. Um, Steps to Justice also has started doing smart forms for family cases. And so um, that's another tool that will be available. They're adding more every quarter. Um, but I mean, the reductions in legal aid services, we're feeling it already in family. Uh, the mediators are feeling it. It's harder to come to a resolution if people don't have access to um, some form of summary or, or other legal advice. Um, you, you know, there's the, the, we need more tools in the toolbox, and I think that unbundling and coaching and you know everything can help. Yes, Heather. So I was going to add that. Um, um, uh, so. The, the internet sites are great. Like I even I go on it uh, every so often to find information. But I always like speaking to a person, um, and it's so much faster, so much easier, right, to, to have a person. So my next level of help I would usually go to uh, would be um, uh, clinics. And in fact, this is what I tell people to do. Um, there are different. There are even like special clinics, special specialized clinics, like. Um, um, the elderly advocacy, or, or even the 519. I don't know if uh, people have heard of the 519. Um, so things like that. And those, um, depending on the clinic, they have different thresholds. So just because you don't qualify for legal aid, you know, don't give up. Because if you look around, sometimes perhaps your local um, community clinic will be able to take you. Um, also check out the university affiliated clinics. Um, so like downtown legal services from U of T and uh, Osgood's CLASP. So you can probably even just give them a call and uh, they hopefully that you get, they can set you up with a, a lawyer. And if not, they can also they can, they can um, refer you to maybe the proper places. So that's kind of like the second layer. Of, of help that I, I suggest to people. And then um, if uh, that's not adequate, I think that then the third layer comes in with the unbundling mm -hmm. that you could sort of like maybe just buy an hour of Joel's time, like just maybe even just do one, one consultation. Um, because I think that uh, this idea of uh, say just buying an hour of consultation, it really is, is not new. I mean, I think that even in the solicitor side, on the, the corporate law, or whatever, I mean, a lot of times people could, they would like to, they, they want to see a lawyer for whatever wills um, or whatever, and they say, I just want some legal advice on whatever, so we can do the same uh, for, for litigation matter. Um, and so that's where I think the unbundling 
layer comes in. And then finally, um, I think for, for those people who could afford it, perhaps they, they could go on full retainer, um, on, on a traditional retainer. Um, but I know that sometimes I don't, I, I have to, um, I want to, maybe Joel, you can jump in, um, because uh, I don't want to come across as someone who is anti full retainer. I mean, perhaps I came across as that. Um, but um, I, I totally recognize the, uh, the advantages of having a lawyer on file and on record. I mean, there are just, there are, there are advantages that it is like, so for example, if your opponent uh, knows that you're being represented by a lawyer, like so a couple of things right away. So they, they're, gonna, they're gonna assume, oh, okay, so your case is not that ridiculous that no one will represent you. Because I know that as a, as a self-rep, there was, uh, and maybe there still is a stigma to being a self-rep, because if you're a self-rep, a lot of lawyers, I should say, um, they kind of go, oh, you can't find someone to represent you. Your case must be really, has no merit. So right away, when you have someone on the record for you, you have that reputational advantage. Well, I'm sorry, there are also, there are some clients who really are not well suited to unbundled legal That's services. True. Um, and so, you know, part of our training for the FLIS project is about making sure that the client has the capacity to do what they are doing um, and that you have enough authority to do what you're being contracted to do. Because you don't want to get into a situation you're, where you're being contracted to, like, let's say, pay for two hours prep for an event, which you should be paying eight hours for, um, because, of course, your professional responsibilities don't change change. So um, part of it is about making sure that the, the client and the circumstances are appropriate for unbundling. Vulnerable clients, you know, maybe no. Um, complicated uh, situations involving domestic violence, maybe no. So uh, we shouldn't be selling unbundling as the be all and end all. It is another very cost affordable tool in the toolbox. Well, I think, I think what I took from what Heather said was that there are sort of different layers yeah. of, of information available <laughs> Um, with a little bit of digging, that start with the very general and move their way up yeah. to a full retainer. And I should emphasize that we're not talking, although family law, I think, is the area where this is most um, evident in terms of people having difficulty navigating the system, partly because of the emotional burden, partly because of the complexity of the process. Um, but. In, in other areas too, such as you know normal like civil lawsuits, property lawsuits, that kind of thing, um, there are again these layers of general information, sure. then increasingly more complex until you get to the point where you need a full retainer. And I think it's very valid to say you need to be able to differentiate those various layers and figure out where the person who is talking to you who has the need might be able to benefit which layer they can they can work with best, right? Um, so that's that's something that's quite interesting that it's starting to divide itself down. Yes, Heather. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, in addition to the layers, um, which is uh, absolutely correct, I also want to um, support what Tammy just said because um, the vetting of clients for self, for coaching um, that has to be. Um, done very carefully because um, I actually came across, like, there was one case I handled and the person really didn't have the, really the capacity um, to, to be coached. Um, and uh, so it's, I, I got into a really big dilemma myself because I was, on the one hand, I don't want to prejudge her and I don't, I want to, oops, I want to help her as much as I can. But then at the same time, one of my senior, one of my senior me mentors put it to me this way. He said, like, do you want to give keys to the car to someone who doesn't have the ability to drive? So, so then when he put it that way, I, I was really taken aback. And because one of the first things that you have to remember as a lawyer is um, it's not just a job, right? I mean, you, you don't want to be... You don't want to be helping someone to make their lives worse. Like when you know that that person really cannot handle a case, and then you're saying, okay, do this, this, and you're basically enabling them to a worser outcome. And I really had difficulty. Well, um, and I think, you know, perhaps in that circumstances, ghostwriting their pleadings would be more of a value add for them, right? Because the bottom line is, if, if, you're, if they don't have the capacity to, to, to benefit from coaching, then you're not really doing them a service. So it's part of kind of tailoring the process to the client's uh, capacity is not the right word, but ability to benefit from. 
Sorry, I was just going through. We, a, a number of questions have come in related to um, uh, paralegal scope um, and to, uh, for example, the, the law coaching clinics. Can paralegals come? Right? I mean, I, I might fit in with non lawyers. The, the yeah. initial so, training will just be for lawyers, lawyers because it's yeah. focusing on the provision yeah. of family law services and the, the limited yeah. scope retainer, and, and that so far is out of scope for But parents. it's not to say that that would never, would, that would never widen out to uh, include, say, paralegals and even non, non licensees. E well, I mean, it's going to depend on what the law society decides is an appropriate scope of practice, right? That too. But, you know, the education isn't a regulated service. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking, you know, because basically you're talking about education and coaching, right? Yeah. You're not talking about actually delivering the service. Right, but the project um, yeah. is funding the training and the, the yeah. project is, is focused on developing um, this capacity amongst families. Family absolutely. Lawyers. All right. Um, yeah, so there have been a number of questions about paralegal scope, but it's a little, although it's a little beyond the um, scope of this particular discussion. The, uh, <laughs> another, there's another question that's been specifically addressed to Noel, and I think what I will do, as long as the person doesn't mind, is provide the person's name um, to Professor Semple, um, and perhaps you and he can have an offline discussion about that, if you can find each other in the great cyber web. Mm -hmm. All right, I just before we finish, um, we've got about 10 minutes left, but I did want to mention um, some of the resources that we've talked a lot about resources that the Law Society has, resources that are on the sheet, resources on the web, resources among, uh, you know, for various practitioners. Law Pro also has some resources to help uh, lawyers with this. Law Pro is the insurance company for lawyers, insures lawyers against malpractice. One of which is this um, um, rather useful thing because one of the things that, that lawyers in particular never think about is what happens when you walk into a courtroom, right? Because we all, you know, I, it sounds so elementary, but we all know where to sit, right? Other people might not. Other people might walk in and see a totally unfamiliar uh, milieu and totally unfamiliar setup. So this one is called the first timers going to court cheat sheet. I think there are some out on the sign-in table. Um, and it's very basic, what to do when entering the courtroom, where you sit, where the witness sits, where the judge sits, etc. cetera. Um, and I know that that is an issue, um, uh, you know, when self-represented litigants come into small claims, you know, sometimes I'll say to them, you know, are you the plaintiff? Like, did you, or are you the person who issued the claim? Yes, I am. Would you mind sitting at that table, please? Right? Are you the person who's defending the claim? Yes, would you sit over here, please? Um, partly because I don't want to give judgment to the wrong party, um, because I'm so used to having everybody in the same place, right? Um, but I think it is important, and if that, that kind of basic information is of interest to you, there are some court tips on the back, um, you'd certainly be welcome to have a copy of that to use. Um, I think that brings us to the end. Has anybody got any further? We have any other questions in the room? Yes. There we go. It's just a microphone so that the web can hear you. So the role of, of paralegals in understanding and supporting, is it self-represented litigants? Yes. We're talking about? Yes. Um, I feel you've presented an amazing panel of a wide spectrum of opinions. Uh, that was quite evident. You usually don't see that. But I feel like somewhere in the middle, uh, we have this whole class of uh, legal practitioners, paralegals, that are not really being incorporated into the solutions that uh, the people of Ontario deserve. I, and we I have happen major, to agree with you on that. Yeah. We have some major issues here. Yeah. And uh, until we really understand what paralegals can do to fix some of these issues, uh, today, I can tell you, having sat in this wonderful environment, it's all about the lawyers. Well, I, I agree with you. It's certainly been all about the lawyers today. That's largely because, and because we have largely focused, I think, 
on the family law aspects because that's where the, the self-represented litigant um, is most often encountered. The, um, the paralegal issue, just to, just to set a little context, I was vice chair of the paralegal standing committee um, and I see paralegals all the time at small, uh, small claims court. I am very supportive of paralegals becoming uh, one of those layers that we were talking about in terms of sort of layers of uh, different layers of representation and different levels of representation. Um, I do think it's an important thing. That said, um, when it comes to regulating a particular delivery, a particular service delivery by any group of people, by any particular group of people, there are a whole lot of details to consider. Um, and I know that the Law Society is working through its details now, those details now, in accordance with Justice Bancala's report, because I was working on that up until May of 2019. Um, and I, it, there, there are so many more details than one can possibly imagine. The upside is that you have five very competent, very good paralegal benchers um, who are also working on those issues. Um, and when I, when I left, or failed to be reelected uh, in May of 2019, it was actually coming along pretty well. You know, things were moving along. It, it always takes longer than one hoped. That, and really, that's the best I can tell you. And you're right, today's program has focused on lawyers, partly because a lot of it's been about family law. Yeah. The presentation did talk about more ladders and, and oh, absolutely. the field, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's but also, I think it's, yeah. There, there's also a secret rule. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a rule four, uh, which uh, allows a judge to uh, permit a non-party to, it, I'm speaking in family law, um, yeah. which allows a judge to permit a family, uh, a non-party to speak. I have to tell you, it, uh, in my own experience and from what I from when I was in practice, uh, talking to other lawyers and certainly talking to self reps, um, I don't think judges are asked very often uh, to allow a sister uh, or, or a neighbor or a friend to, to speak. Uh, and I don't think it comes up very often, but uh, I have been stunned. Uh, I, I'm frequently amazed at uh, things. And one of the things that amazes me is that the Law Society bylaws says that for everybody else in the world, except for family law, you can have a neighbor or friend who doesn't have a license appear. Yeah. Uh, that's a bylaw for uh, section what, mm -hmm. in the 20s, whatever it is. You can have, and you can have a family member. The only rule is the family member can't charge or can't get any benefit, right. and the neighbor or friend cannot, can't get any benefit, can't do it more than three times. But you can't do that in family law. And I've often wondered why is it that family law is so zealously protective of uh, only members of the union uh, are being allowed to speak as opposed to friends, neighbors, uh, etc. cetera, uh, when we acknowledge that in every other area of law, you, you can do it. So I'll just it, say that in that respect, I think family law is different. And I do think that people with personal relationships sometimes contribute to the resolution of the case and sometimes not so. That's true. And you have new partners who insist on being in a room in a conference. Um, and it's the judge's role to govern the process in a way that meets the objectives of the rules. And I think when you're dealing with related parties, I think that raises different issues than different professions. That overlooks the, that overlooks the inability of all kinds of people to speak effectively, to speak their mind, to be able to speak in an organized fashion, to speak the language, to speak uh, uh, comfortably to authority. I hear what you're saying. I'm not disagreeing with any of that. All that I'm saying is that it seems to me that there are ways available because none of this prevented it in every other area of family, uh, every other area of law. The bylaw says that it could, you can do it everybody else, you just can't do it here. So if we're saying there's a difference in family law, then let's address the difference. Let's say, okay, how can we protect people? There's a whole concept of Mackenzie Friends. I thought you were going to refer to Mackenzie Friends when you spoke about uh, England. Uh, it's uh, not a current resource, it's a potential resource. Yeah. I'm gonna so, have to cut you off because we've got about three minutes, two, three minutes left and I apologize. I wanted sparks, but not at 1158. Um, <laughs> I have one more question over here. Yes. Um, it's not really a question, it's more of a comment. I'm a lawyer, I've been doing this for 28 years, staff and law exclusively. If we're talking about 
we're talking about potential ways to help people in the existing system, but my comment is really we should try to have systemic changes to make the system easier for people, whether they have to navigate it themselves, with lawyers, with or without legal aid, limited scope retainers, et cetera, but I think we should really try to improve the system at a systemic level, less delays in court, simplified forms, simplified processes, et cetera. That will make things easier for everyone, no matter the manner in which they have to proceed in their case. Glenda, I'm still waiting for your proposal to the Family yes. Rules Committee. <laughs> okay. To do exactly that. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to conclude by saying we're concluding this morning's discussion. And um, I'm very happy that the discussion's been so lively and so full. Thank you all to coming. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming and joining us today. Uh, we know there are tools and resources. It's our job, then, to get them out to the people who need them. We all have a role to support the ongoing work that the Law Society and its partners do every day on the Access to Justice file. I hope that you'll take advantage of other programs in the Access to Justice Week, and thank you again for coming and taking part.